Well, good morning. We are honored to be able to be here with you this morning. Will you stand with us? We are going to open it up with some worship. I hope that you will join us. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind? Failures I tried to hide. It was my turn till I met you. You called my name and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glory. You called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. Let's sing at your mercy. Your mercy has saved my soul. Welcome everyone to the Orchard Sunday services, 8.30 and 10 a.m. here at the church. And don't forget that the 10 a.m. is also online. My name is Cheryl Bach and I am the CFO for Guard Protection Services. Uh, my favorite things about the Orchard are definitely Daniel's sermons and the fact that the people here are really warm and really friendly. My name is David Bach, her husband, and I'm a broadcaster. and. What I love most about the orchard is, I think it, it just feels right. It feels like home. Yeah. Oh, and if you are watching service online, remember to write in your comments and your questions. We want to thank you for your generosity with the orchard's vision. Love God, love people. And if you want to give to the orchard, you can do so at our website, theorchardlife.com. You can use the Orchard app, or you can use the donation box here at the building. 
If you're new to the orchard and you'd like to get some more information or just connect, go to our email, connect at theorchardlife.com. That's connect at theorchardlife.com. If you want to explore some personal growth or maybe growing as a couple or a family, you can also find some pastoral counseling by emailing counseling at theorchardlife.com. Well, enough of us. Let's uh, get ready to go worship and watch one of Dan's, Daniel's great sermons. Dan? I suck. I'm tearing. All right. Right at the end. Let's go love God and love people. Come on, Shorty. Hey, Cheryl and David. <laughs> Oh, wow. Well, welcome to the Orchard. We're so glad you're here this morning. And we have, I don't know if you, you might not have known this, but we have a surprise today. We have something to announce and to celebrate. If you didn't know that, if you didn't check Facebook or you just happened to be here today, today is a big day for us. We're going to celebrate. And I, so I told the light and the sound and the band people to have some fun today. So if, you, if somewhere in your experience or paradigm this doesn't fit into it and you're upset at somebody, blame me. I'm, it's okay. Because we have, there are sometimes there are things worth celebrating. And at the orchard, the thing we celebrate most is life change, salvations, and baptism. But today we have something that's happened in our midst, a miracle, that we want to stop and thank God for. So I'm going to have the uh, staff come on up. Staff, and we have some staff and elders. You don't have to, yeah, yeah, there you go. Okay, yes, yes, way to go. So before we do this, I'm going to play a video from January of 2020. You guys remember that, right? Remember back in January 2020, none of us knew what was coming, and so we've forgotten all about it? Well, I said some things, and I don't know how fast I actually talked back then, so I'm about to, excuse me, sir, I'm about, I am about to, um, you're going to watch a video of me in 2020 casting some vision for what could be in our finances. And so let's uh, watch this video. And you know what? The one thing I'm committed to, to being is, is honest about our finances. I don't want there to be ambiguity about where we stand. And so I've told you this before. It's not my favorite news to deliver, but, but we have a building debt of about $600,000. And I don't say that to dismay us. I say that because that's what we're working to pay off. I am, I am dedicated and working to pay it off, as are the elders. And we have some incredibly generous people here who, who know it's a game changer when this, this debt is gone. That the orchard will move out into the community and show what loving God and loving people looks like in a whole new way. Coming alongside of nonprofits, helping those in need, intentionally targeting some specific areas in the community that would just tangibly change lives. Supporting local and international moves of God. And we, we pay off the debt. The orchard moves in a whole new paradigm of being able to support this community in a way that most nonprofits never get the opportunity to do. And I've been talking with some people about this. We, uh, lead pastor two years ago, I, uh, I came, I was invited to be lead pastor here. We had $700,000 of debt. I said on January 2020 that we had um, $600,000 in debt. And through generous people like yourself and people stepping up and giving and being sacrificial, I have in my hand the promissory note of the orchard, um, the original 2004 that paid for this building and this property and many others, the gathering center. And as of this week, this debt is... We're gonna have a little bit of fun today. Yes, we are debt free here at the orchard. And um, that means so much. Thank, yeah, I, we are overjoyed. I wanna say a few things, first of all. Uh, I wanna say some very important things. Um, God didn't save us from a great debt, He saved us for a greater destiny. This is important for us to know, Orchard, that God, God is positioning us as a church and a people to be a catalytic force of redemption locally and regionally and beyond. And so now it's time for us as a church to stop dreaming about what happens when we get rid of the debt. So what, what now? What now? And I look around and I see so many faces of people who have been so faithful um, and, and given so much to be a part of this. And I am just so grateful to be your, and so humbled to be lead pastor of this. And praise God for the work he has done. I have to say, there is no glory in this for any person. It is a, is a miracle the way this worked out. And it is all from God. And amen, yes. 
crazy. It's all, it, thank you, God. What's so cool about the way God works is that today the sermon to be scheduled is the second half of John 10. You know we've been walking through John, right? Because during this season after the, the politics and the pandemic and all the things that rose to the surface, we felt it was time to put Jesus Christ back to elevate him back up above all things, above all people, above all issues. Jesus above all. We have a saying here in this church, keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing is Jesus. So we're studying the book of John. And here in John 10, it was scheduled. The topic is about a people celebrating the the miracle of God setting their house of worship free. And it falls on this Sunday, as we sit here, we celebrate a miracle of God setting the house of worship free. You know, there's, there's so many coincidences when you, when you follow and are in love with Jesus. Things like this happen. But John, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he records things and he, he writes things in his book that the other gospels do not. So much of, the, of John is unique. John also assumes that we as the reader, we know a lot more. And if you've been with us the last couple of months, there are so many things that we found deeply embedded in the Old Testament that give context to what's happening. And today, once again, we're going to see a regular, ordinary thing that, that Jesus goes through, but we're going to see what's going on behind the scenes. So today, we're halfway through John 10, and John switches seasons on us. It's a different season. So let's jump into verse 22. Then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. And this is a pretty typical John uh, pattern. We have Jesus. We have a location and a, festi- a season. He's celebrating the religious festival of dedication. You remember in Jesus and John, we've, we've seen so many festivals that he's celebrated. We have the Feast of Tabernacles, at Sukkot, and Passover, and, and so many others commanded by Moses in Exodus in the Old Testament. We preached about how Jesus interacted with these festivals. And so here we have Jesus once again traveling to Jerusalem to participate in a festival, the Festival of Dedication. And as a church, um, one thing you know about me is I love, find, I love going into the Old Testament and finding what's deep, deep, deep in the Old Testament and what it means in the New Testament and for us. I believe the entire Old Testament points to Jesus. So let's go in the Old Testament, let's look deep into the Old Testament, and let's find this festival of dedication and see what it has to say. There's, there's just one big problem. You see, the festival of dedication isn't in the Old Testament. The festival of dedication is only mentioned here in John 10. Jesus, what, is, what is John setting the stage for? What is Jesus traveling to Jerusalem to celebrate? What's going on here? So let's look at this festival of dedication. To find out more about it, we don't look at the New Testament or Old Testament. We have to look at the ancient historian Josephus and these two books that happen between the Old Testament and New Testament, First and Second Maccabees. Both tell about a particularly painful time in the Jewish nation. You see, prior to the book of Maccabees, prior to this, what we're going to study today, Alexander the Great had swept across the known world and conquered so much of it. And when he died, there was a huge power vacuum. And it says that his generals picked up crowns and put them on. And it was divided into fours. And and through different shrewd leaders and maneuvering, one person who received power was, his name was Antiochus. He gave himself for that name when he rose and ascended to power on the Seleucid throne in September 3rd, 174 BC. He would later add another name, Antiochus Epiphanes. And the name Epiphanes means God manifest. Antiochus Epiphanes set himself up as a god over the people he ruled in the Seleucid dynasty. And and here's a picture of a coin that was made during this time. And, and, And you guys are all Greek scholars, so you will be able to read this. You see over there on the right side, as you read with me, it says, King Antiochus, God manifest, bearer of victory. And let's just leave that up. Can you imagine your business card if you had the audacity of King Antiochus? I mean, it would say, Jimmy, plumber, God manifest, bearer of clean pipes. <laughs> Victoria, multi level marketer, God manifest, bearer of essential oils. I mean, we would see the audacity of a man. He would put it on the coin. I'm God manifest. I'm the bearer of victory. Let's get it on the coins. Let's put it out there. There's only one problem with having a ruler who thinks he's God. It's he doesn't like you to worship anybody else. And this is where it became difficult for the Jewish nation because Antiochus Epiphanes, God manifest, self-declared, wanted to Hellenize everyone. And that Hellenize means make Greek. He brought in Greek culture, uh, Greek customs, and he brought in Greek idols. Not only that, 
he outlawed Jewish customs. Everywhere he could find a Torah, the Old Testament, he would have them burned. He banned worship of the Old Testament. He banned worship of Yahweh at the Jewish temple. And you guys know the Jewish temple. We've talked about this before in this place. The Jewish temple is, this, is a sacred place designed by God. It's where the presence of God would reside amongst his people. The temple, the holy place, it had a section in the very center called the Holy of Holies, where only the high priest could go only once a year. It was a sacred grounds. There were strict rules on how not to profane it. So when Antiochus Epiphanes traveled to Jerusalem, he entered the holy courts of the temple. It was defiling. But he wasn't done yet. He wanted to squash this religion. He wanted to root out this religion and erase it from history. So he walked into the temple and he commanded that the pagan idols be put up in the temple of the Most High God. And then on the altar where the Hebrews would sacrifice a lamb for the atonement of sins, he had them place a sow and he bled it. And the pig is ritually unclean. It's an abomination for the Jewish people and placing a pig on the altar of God was a complete and utter desecration of Jewish faith, Jewish culture, and Jewish hope. It was there in that place and it was there in the temple, in the temple grounds, where Antiochus decided to declare himself Epiphanes, God manifest. I and God are one, he would say. It was during this time of ruin that a small band of Jewish people decided to retake the most holy place. They weren't going to stand for this. Judah Maccabee and his brothers and countrymen began to wage guerrilla warfare on the Seleucid armies of Antiochus Epiphanes. The Maccabean army began to rack up victories and finally, you know, after a hot battle, liberated Jerusalem and took it back. And Judah knew the importance of the temple. And on December 14th, 164 BC, he and the priests began to purify the temple, to remove the defiling things and the idols. They began to reinstitute rituals and they cleansed the altar and they began to conduct ceremonies. The only problem they found is Judah and his men could only find one vial of the holy consecrated oil that burns the menorah inside the temple. By God's design, he'd, he'd said there must be a, a, a menorah inside the temple which sheds light on the bread of presence. And they only had one vial that would last one day and one day only. It took another seven to eight days to have the, to have the oil fully consecrated and ready for use. So what would they do for the rest of the time? But in faith, they lit the menorah. It only had a day's worth. And legend has it that the menorah burned for two days and miraculously burned for eight more days until the priests brought forward the new consecrated oil. Eight days of miraculous light amidst the darkness that Antiochus Epiphanes had brought over the Jewish nation. The temple, the house of God where they worshiped had been freed, had been purified, had been dedicated and to mark this amazing victory, this miracle of light, this purification of the temple, a festival was created. And it was called the Festival of Dedication. That's where Jesus is in John 10. At this festival that celebrated this, he's in Jerusalem. He's in the temple grounds during the Festival of Dedication. Now, you know this festival by another name. You know this festival by the name Hanukkah. Festival of Lights. We have a menorah with eight lights and then one extra to celebrate the eight miraculous nights that the, the menorah burned. So Hanukkah is looking, what, what Hanukkah is in, the, in a nutshell, it is a looking back at how God through the Maccabees had saved them politically and military, had saved them and clarif or cleansed the temple. How God had worked miracles through someone to save them. But it's not only that. It's also looking forward to what God will do in the future and the miracles that he will do to free his people. Some interesting things about the Jewish tradition with Hanukkah. It has nine candles. The ninth sits in the middle. You can see it here. The ninth, as you always see, it is always elevated. Sometimes it's on the sides. Most of the times it's in the middle. It's always elevated. And the ninth candle has a name. It's called the shamash, which means the servant candle. And each night they would start by lighting the shamash. It was, the, it was the main candle set above the others. And the shamash gave light 
to all the other lights. All other light comes from this shamash, this candle of the servant's light that is set above the others. Now, that's meaningful. Each night they would light it because this middle candle that rises above, that represents the Messiah. You see, they, rep- they, they celebrate the eight days that God did miracles in the past, but they looked forward to the day when the Messiah would come and work more miracles in the future. All, almost all these holidays they have is a looking back and a looking forward, a looking to someone. And the Shamash candle that gives light to all the other candles, that gives light to all the earth. They said the Messiah will give light to everything. He is above all things and all light will come from him, lights the rest of it. So Hanukkah, a festival of dedication, celebrates that God freed us from our captors, but that God will someday come and free us from our captors. You see, what they looked for, what, they, what the idea of a Jewish Messiah was during the time of Jesus is a political leader, a political and military leader who would be like the King David or Gideon or like Judah Maccabee, a Messiah who would come and throw off the yoke of the Roman rule who would lead them and would sit on the throne like King David and rule them. Hanukkah is to look ahead in faith and hope at the Messiah who would come and throw off the people who were over them, a political leader who would lead them to military freedom. So these people during, June, during John 10, they're in the middle of Hanukkah, the festival of lights, the festival of dedication. They are constantly thinking of Judah Maccabees. That, that is on their mind, looking back at having the, um, the Seleucid armies thrown off and looking forward to a Messiah who they believed would throw off the yoke of the Roman Empire. And in that context of them looking for a certain kind of Messiah, Jesus is in the temple during festival dedication. And that context sheds light on the question that they're about to ask him. Review. Then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews were gathered around him saying, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Hmm. With Judah Maccabee in liberation fresh on the mind of an entire nation celebrating this, looking for a military and political leader, a Messiah to rise up, they say, Jesus, tell us plainly, is it you? Are, we, are you the one we've been looking for? Because now would be a real good time. In other words, are you going to rise up the way Judah Maccabee did? Are you going to rise up like King David, like Gideon? Enough parables. We've seen the miracles. Enough of these stories. Speak plainly. Is it you? Are you the one to lead us to freedom? You see, they wanted a Messiah who would fit their hopes. They made a Messiah in their image. They made God to look the way they wanted him to. And Orchard and people listening online, we are so guilty of this. We're still guilty. Expecting God to do and say and come through the way that we think he should. Lamont said this, you can safely assume you've created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people that you do. (laughs) So we must ask ourselves, am I following the authentic Jesus of the Bible or am I following some other Jesus that I've created, some other Messiah that I think should fit my political aspirations or, or my agenda over here, my cultural agenda? Which Jesus am I following? This is a question I want us to wrestle with because it's important. We follow Jesus by faith based on his life and death and resurrection. We come to him for salvation. And beyond that, we learn to become like him in his nature as we follow him. Again, this is why we're elevating him above all things. We want an authentic, real Jesus. A Jesus who didn't avoid sinful people, but he met them in their brokenness. A Jesus who didn't bring judgment to to sinners, but through grace and love, called them out of their lifestyle of sin. A Jesus who said, pray and love your enemies. A Jesus who died for the people who spat on him. A Jesus who would not allow religion to derail his movement. 
A Jesus who would courageously stand up against the culture and live for what is right and holy. It's important to, 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 that we follow the true and authentic Jesus. This is why it's, I, I've been telling you this whole series, it's important that we, we get in God's word, but that we get God's word in us. It's important to be reading the gospels about Jesus because it's when, we, when you see that you're off somewhere, adjust to become more like him. The whole goal of, of Christianity is to become more like Jesus. So we need to look up and see if it is Jesus we're actually following. It's important we follow him and not create a Jesus based on our biases and beliefs and preferences of church. Because if, if, if we're not following the authentic Jesus, we're missing out on the authentic life that he called us to. And for many people who say, you know, I read all about this in the Bible, and it's supposed to be this, this, and this, and I don't see any of it. Maybe we need to look up the trail and see if it's actually Jesus we're following. Here in, in, in John 10, they missed out on who Jesus was. Not because of his miracles, they saw those. Not because of the signs, they saw that. It's because he did not fulfill the political agenda that they wanted. And we, we must be careful not to expect God to fulfill our agenda, but instead that we're on God's plan of love God and love people and go out into the world and to declare salvation in no one else but him. It is important that, that we as the orchard and God's people are on heaven's agenda. Verse 24, the Jews gathering around, they asked, they said, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you're the Messiah, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you didn't believe. The works I do in my Father's name, they, they testify about me. The, the, the miracles I've done, they, they, they talk about me. They point to me. Jesus replies to them, I did tell you, and I did show you. I did signs. I did miracles. In fact, remember all the miracles? Jesus, he's done so many miracles by this time. He even did the messianic miracles we talked about a month ago. That was the miracles that, that the, the priests believe only the Messiah could do. Only the Messiah could, could heal a man born blind. And Jesus did it. Like, he's like, I've done it. I've done the miracles. I've told you plainly. I've done it all. Now, in the context of Hanukkah, what they're asking and what Jesus is saying hold a little more contextual weight you see, the, the future Messiah is a huge, like we've talked about, is a huge part of the Hanukkah celebration. In fact, they have some readings from it where they say things like this as they would light it. They would say, blessed are you, Lord, our God, King of the universe, who performed miracles in our forefathers' days and in our, and in our time. And they go on to sing a song after they light it that goes and says, your name is great and your miracles are great for your wonders and your salvation. We look, they were looking forward. They were looking back and saying, thank you for what you've done and looking forward and saying, we cannot wait for what you will do all about the works. There was so much about the miracles of the Messiah. In fact, there's a game that children would play during Hanukkah season. This is a dreidel right here. It has some, some letters on it. It says, hey, pay, noon, gimel. And the dreidel is directly related to the Maccabees and what happened at Hanukkah. Four sides, those four letters, and each of those letters is an acronym that means a great miracle was done here. If you get one of these from Jerusalem, it says a great miracle that was done here. If you get one outside of Jerusalem, it says a great miracle was done there. So this is one that from Jerusalem, it says a great miracle was done here. In other words, here in our midst, at the Maccabees, a great miracle was done. The menorah, the freeing of the temple, an entire holiday created to remember it, a children's game created to teach the, to teach the kids so they grow up in it. Every night we're singing the same songs and praying the prayers so that we remember what happened, but... At the center of it all, the shamash, that the Messiah will come. And the miracles that he did then, he will do a great miracle here again. In fact, the sages, they studied this so much. The sages, they added up all the numbers that these letters represent. It's 358. And then they added up all the numbers of the word Messiah, and it's 358. They believed everything in Hanukkah not only said thank you for the past, but pointed to the coming of the Messiah. And they said he will do a great work here again looking forward to see what he would do. So there's all this talk about miracles in John 10. It's because of the theme of Hanukkah. The conversation is, is, is making more sense now, right? Tell us plainly. Tell us plainly. Are you the Messiah? Will you do things like Maccabees did? We've seen your miracles, but will you say us? Tell us plainly. I have told you, and I've shown you, but you don't believe me. And he continues. 
He says those things and he says, but you don't believe me because you are not my sheep. He switches themes here. You're not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. He says, my sheep, no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who's given them to me, he's greater than all. And no one can snatch them from my father's hand. I spoke in depth two weeks ago about sheep. I'm not going to do any deep dive on sheep because we did that. It was on July 2nd. It's a sermon called Sheep Happens. And you can catch that on any of our stuff, okay, websites and that. So I'm not going to talk about sheep. But I want to I pull out a few things that, that, from this, okay. First of all, I give them eternal life. They shall never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Notice Jesus says, no one will snatch them from my hand. This is important for one of you here today. Did you know your salvation is not held in place by your sin or lack thereof? Did you know your salvation is not conditional, shaky, based on your good works or lack thereof? Did you know your salvation is not held in place because of the good things you're hoping to do? Did you know your salvation is not crumbled because of the bad things you've done in your past? Did you know that if you have salvation in Jesus, it's held in the good shepherd's hand and there is no one and nothing that can shake that? Your sin doesn't shake the hand of a shepherd. The good shepherd's hand cannot be shaken by your, by your deeds. And for some of you, the only thing you need to know today is that if you believe in Jesus that he died and rose again, and you have in faith prayed to receive that, and you have walked in here condemned, just ashamed, oh, if these people knew, I can't even live in here. You need to know that your salvation is not held by your actions, it's held by his actions. Your salvation is not held by your works, your salvation is held by his works on a cross, and no one can snatch that. So for any of you in condemnation today, Jesus holds your salvation. But notice in the next verse, my father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them from my father's hand. So we have the, Jesus brings the father into it. Verse 28, no one can snatch them from my hand. Verse 29, no one can snatch them from my father's hand. So whose hand is it? Whose hands are you in? You see, Jesus is saying something here that the people listening and the Pharisees and people listening would have immediately known what he is claiming. And the next verse is something that sent ripples through them. Jesus says in verse 30, I and the Father are one. The hand of the Father and the hand of this traveling rabbi are one? And our salvation is held in this guy's hands? You, I, you can't even imagine how inflammatory this would have been. You see, Jesus and the Father aren't the exact same person, but in the divine mystery of the Trinity, they're in perfect union. And the hand of the Father and the hand of the Son hold your salvation securely. He said, I and the Father are one. Do you see what he's claiming here? He's claiming divinity. Now, now pause, time out. Let's go back five minutes. You remember everything I say, you never forget. Do you remember where Jesus is standing while he's saying these things? Where's he standing? In the temple, correct. Do you remember what festival was going on where Jesus makes these claims about being God manifest? What is it? That's right, the festival of dedication. So we have Jesus standing in the temple courts, claiming to be God manifest during Hanukkah. You guys, 200 years prior, another man stood in the temple courts and made the very same claim. Antiochus Epiphanes claimed to be God manifest in the temple courts. And Jesus, the true Messiah, stands in the temple courts saying, I am God manifest. I and the Father are one. Now, many people have wondered, uh, and they tried to, 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 to work around Jesus' words here. He didn't really mean he and God are one. It doesn't mean he's God. He didn't claim divinity. And, and again, I just want to say, let, let, take all that aside. Let's look at how they respond to him. Okay, well, these, the, the Pharisees who had all this cultural context, let's see how they respond. I and the Father are one. Again, the Jewish opponents picked up stones to, to stone him. But Jesus said, ho, oh, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these good works do you stone me? And they say, we're not stoning you for any good work, but for blasphemy because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Let me just say it once again. Anyone who says Jesus never claimed to be divine doesn't know their Bible. He's making a claim here. They weren't confused about what he was saying. They wanted to stone him for claiming to be God. 
In the following verses, they have some more conversation, and shocker, they pick up more stones to stone him again, and Jesus escapes. He leaves, leaves town. The second half of John 10 focuses on a central theme of the book of John. John always brings up one thing important, that is identity. Who is this Jesus? Who is he? And there's three groups of people I want to talk to today that are in John 10 right here, that are also in this room and listening online. The first group are those who are confused about the identity of Jesus. How long will you keep us in suspense? Is it you? Are you the Messiah? Tell me plainly. They were confused because on one hand, Jesus was doing all the right things. He was proving to be the Messiah. But on the other, it wasn't fitting the Jesus that they kind of preferred and thought was coming. They had God in a box. They had their rules for how God would act, for how Jesus the Messiah would look. Jesus would not go out. The Messiah would not go outside of these boxes. And so when he came, he he wasn't fitting in it. The challenge for us, and I want to say this to to really sink in, is the Jesus you believe and claim to follow, is it the Jesus of the Bible? That's a really important question for us to look at. That's a question worth you going home and, and writing some things down and studying and looking through to see maybe where your biases or agendas aren't following Jesus of the Bible. Does the Jesus you follow invite you to ask and do and say and believe things that the Jesus of the Bible did and said and asked you to believe? Like, does the Jesus of the Bible, who said eternity matters, he said, go out into all the world and tell all people and invite them in to my kingdom. Does the Jesus you follow, does he prompt you to go out and open your mouth and open your life and invite people in and speak about Jesus and declare and invite them to come be a part of his kingdom. Does the Jesus you follow, follow the, the last instructions he gave us on earth? Jesus of the Bible wants us to be holy. Does the Jesus that you follow endorse your sinful lifestyle or maybe let you live without remorse of it? Jesus of the Bible wants us to be forgiving and extend grace and love. But does the Jesus that you follow Demand that certain groups of sinners be held more accountable than others? Are certain sins worse in your life because, well, that's how it is? Jesus of the Bible, he went to the needy, he went to the vulnerable, and he told us to. Does the Jesus you follow prompt you to go and open your heart and open your life and give and serve those who are broken, those from broken homes and broken lives, the vulnerable, the needy, Jesus of the Bible made it very clear that there is one way to heaven, and that's through him. Does your Jesus allow for other paths to heaven? That is not Jesus of the Bible. Jesus of the Bible invited us to drop our happiness-driven lifestyle, pick up a cross, and follow him daily. But does your Jesus mainly just want you to be happy? Is your Jesus mainly concerned with your happiness in life? In fact, have you made some some gray decisions, but you've actually thought or said, God wouldn't want me to remain unhappy here. He wouldn't want me to remain unhappy in this relationship or this or that. God's concerned with my happiness primarily. Those are just a few examples. They're difficult questions when I turn them on myself. But I would encourage you to ask these questions. Because here in John and here in 2021, many are confused about Jesus because he's not fitting into the way we think he should. Some of those things I said were maybe a little bit uncomfortable. I want to stick with my version of Jesus. (laughs) You know, like we get a chance to adjust or justify the way we we live. And during communion, here's here's something that you can pray, a prayer like this. During communion, here's a prayer if you're confused or if you find that you have some parts of Jesus that, that aren't in the Bible. You would say this, Jesus, I want to know you. I want to know the real you. I don't want to follow any false Messiah. Reveal to me where my view of you is off, where I've made you in my image. I want, to, I want the real and true Jesus as my Savior. During communion, pray that Jesus reveal himself to you and show you where you are following something that might not be of him. The second, that's the first group was confused. The second group, they weren't confused at all. They continued to reject Jesus. They continued, they were the ones that either walked away or they brought the stones and this group is, is smaller, but it's present. You're here. You're, you're living, you're, you're tracking with us. Now, you've heard this whole Christian thing before. 
Yeah, you, you may have been raised in church. And, and unfortunately, you've been burned by some Christians. You've been burned by some churches. You've had some bad experiences, and you don't want anything to do with it. And I wish I could sit down with you and talk you through this more often or about more of your story, but I just want to say this. Where religion and religious people have failed you, don't transfer the actions of an imperfect people onto a perfect God. Jesus wants to reveal himself to you. He wants to reveal himself to you in a way that transcends the people who have hurt you in the past. And so there's a prayer that you can pray during communion, and I understand it, I get it. This, is, this will take courage for you to pray. There will be something like this. Jesus, you know my thoughts about you and what I've been through, and I'm doubtful at best. But I give you permission to reveal your true nature to me. I'm open to you proving me wrong. Maybe for you, if you're in the second group, you just say, Jesus, I, I'm open to be proven wrong. Reveal yourself to me. The final group is found in John 10, 42. It's the group when, when Jesus left the temple, they followed him out into the wilderness, out of town. They wanted to hear more. They wanted more of him. They, they sought him out, and it says in verse 42, and in that place, many believed in Jesus. They followed the Messiah out of their desire to be more like him, and they, they, they get received salvation. They believed him here. And there might be some of you here today, and, I, and I want, on a day like today where we're declaring freedom, there, there are some of you here today or with us online who, who are ready, who are ready to believe in Jesus. What your spiritual journey has been intense. You've been through some twists and turns, but however it went, it got you here today. And for someone here, you are ready to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The Bible says, confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe. He died and rose again, and you'll be saved. And so, church, let's all bow our heads and pray together. And if you're here and you're ready, or in your home, and you want to pray to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want you to pray these words and believe in your heart. Jesus, I need you. I know you died and rose again. I give you my life. I give you my past. I need you in my present. I need you as my hope and my future. Take my sin. Take my shame. Holy Spirit, fill me. My life is yours, God. As we go into communion, one of those prayers that we talked about is yours. Communion is aligning yourself with the real Jesus, the Shamash, servant, who came from heaven and was beaten his blood was shed, his flesh was broken so that we could be forgiven. So as you take communion today, it is because we follow the true Messiah, Jesus, Savior of the world. And then Orchard, I want you to sing and respond to this Savior and all he's done for us. Every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, a name above every other name. Jesus, the only one that could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, 
We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none besides you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around. song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one that could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. tell but I told the uh, production team to have some fun today and take some liberties we have one more song we're going to sing and it talks about I was walking in the wayside lost and lonely 
chasing the high life, trying to satisfy my soul. The lives I believed left me crying. I saw the lightning from heaven. I've never been the same. I'm gonna climb the mountain, I'm gonna shout it out. I'm a child of love. I found a world of freedom, a friend in Jesus. I'm a child of love. And I wanna remind us of something today that as great as it is we've paid off the debt on this uh, wood and stone and mortar, that there is a debt that has been paid off that is far, far more worth celebrating. Orchard, I want us to celebrate the salvation of our debt and the freedom from sin today as we never have before. I don't, I, I don't care if you raise your hand, raise your heart. I don't care if you raise your voice, raise your heart, but let us declare the goodness that we are a child of love because of the work that Jesus has done in erasing our debts. Amen? Let's have some fun. Nothing can change. And nothing can change the way you love me. And nothing can change the way. And I belong to you. Yes, I do. And nothing can separate. Do you believe it? Sing it with me. And nothing can change the way you love me. And nothing can change. I belong to you, yes I do, and nothing can separate. I'm gonna climb a mountain, hey! I am a child of love, I found a world of freedom.
Orchard, as we put one season behind us and we look ahead, we get to dream about what God has for us in the future. I want to remind us of something. I'll say it again. God didn't save us from a great debt. He saved us for a great, greater destiny. And I want to apply that to you in your life. God didn't just save you from a great debt of sin. He saved you for a greater destiny. There are works, there are things for you to do to partner with the Almighty to see the kingdom of God change, to see your work change, see your cul-de-sac, your neighborhood, and our region, and our world change. Orchard, I'm going to bless you today. May you go forth and be the people of Jesus who follow him authentically in love, that you would go forth and love God and love people in such a way that the world sees him for who he is. Amen? Hey, thank you for having fun with us. We'll see you next week. I'm gonna climb a mountain.